Hi, my name is Ryan Heinzman. I'm a Geography PhD student here at Arizona State University. For many years, scientists at ASU have looked at microclimatology as an important and increasingly relevant subject. Researchers such as Melvin Marcus, Tony Brazel, and Dave Hondula have been pioneers in understanding topics such as glaciology, desert climatology, and urban climatology through work in the field. My own personal research stems from this similar approach with an interest in fieldwork and microclimatology with the creation of a new weather station network in Joshua Tree National Park. This active approach to scientific research is one of the inspirations for the interactive geovisualizations used in these physical geography exercises. You're able to be a virtual scientist, go out into the field, make observations, and come to conclusions about different topics. In this particular lab, you're exploring the microclimatology of the Grand Canyon, the spectacular case study for understanding complex topography and climate. Let's get started. Over the course of a few miles across the Grand Canyon, temperature and precipitation can vary widely. At the bottom of the canyon during the summertime, temperatures can exceed 40 degrees Celsius, whereas along the north rim during the wintertime, temperatures often fail to reach above freezing. Over 350 centimeters of snowfall reaches the north rim each winter. About half of that falls at the south rim. Meanwhile, in the bottom of the canyon, about 25 centimeters of precipitation uh, falls during the entire year. Locations around the Grand Canyon also have localized climate variations caused by a multitude of factors such as shadows, uh, surface cover, amount of water that's found at the location. These are going to have influence on the temperature at that location. In this lab we'll look a little bit closer at what influences the climate and the microclimatology of the Grand Canyon and how that impacts plants and animals within its walls. It's much cooler at the canyon rims compared to the canyon floor. The atmosphere up there is thinner, with fewer air molecules and a lower density. The lower density results in a lowered air temperature. As one hikes down into the canyon, the atmosphere becomes thicker and temperature increases. Because of the complex topography and differential surface heating within the Grand Canyon, this temperature change with height isn't consistent, particularly if you're looking at it seasonally between summer and winter. In the summertime, the lapse rate can approach 8 degrees Celsius per kilometer as you hike down into the canyon. So if you were to start at the south rim, for example, at 29 degrees Celsius or roughly 84 degrees Fahrenheit, and you hike down to the bottom of the canyon at 700 meters or about 2,500 feet, you'd have a temperature well over 40 degrees or over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. This changes seasonally though. In the winter time, the lapse rate between the rim and the bottom of the canyon ranges around five degrees Celsius per kilometer. So if you started out at the north rim at six degrees Celsius, your overall change would be about seven and a half degrees Celsius, or uh, about 13 degrees Fahrenheit, not nearly as much as during the summer. This winter change is a result of multiple factors. Since cold air up on the north rim and south rim is denser than warm air, it'll often sink off of the rims down into the canyon below. This is called cold air pooling and can result in relatively lower temperatures down at the canyon floor. On occasion, the temperature of the canyon can be lower than the temperature on the rim. This happens mostly in wintertime and with uh, special occasions, especially in the morning when the sun heats up the air along the canyon rim, but the bottom of the canyon stays cooler. This cool, dense air that's sunk into the bottom of the canyon is trapped below that warm layer of air. This is called an inversion. And oftentimes, if the cold air at the bottom of the canyon uh, reaches dew point and condenses into clouds, you can get this sea of clouds form at the bottom of the canyon. So why do we see a difference in summer versus winter temperature change with height in the Grand Canyon? It partly has to do with the seasonal change and the amount of insulation or incoming solar radiation that is received at the Grand Canyon. As the sunlight enters the Earth's atmosphere, some of it's absorbed uh, or reflected back out by the atmosphere, and the rest of it will reach the surface. The surface heats up and re-emits this energy as what's called long-wave radiation. 
the sun that's coming in is shortwave radiation at higher energy. The earth heats up after it receives the sunlight, re uh, emits this energy as long wave radiation. This long wave radiation is really good at warming up the air. But the amount of insulation, the amount of resulting long wave radiation that rises off the surface at the Grand Canyon changes throughout the year. During the summertime, the northern hemisphere of the Grand Canyon is facing towards the sun. And so uh, the canyon walls are going to receive much more direct sunlight. A lot more heat is going to come off the walls, and so the air temperature is going to increase down at the bottom of the canyon. So you can see in these images here that this is a summertime. We have a lot more. You can see the Grand Canyon really well. Uh, the temperature right at the canyon floor is really hot. Most direct sunlight during the summertime here. Whereas the winter time, there are a lot more shadows, a lot cooler, and the south facing uh, side of the Grand Canyon is getting a bit more sun because the sun is lower in the horizon towards the south during the winter time. This results in less energy being absorbed by the surface, less warming of the air, leading to overall cooler temperatures at the bottom of the canyon. These deep shadow sections of the canyon often might not even receive any sunlight during the winter time. The Grand Canyon, along with much of the southwest United States, see seasonal pulses of precipitation, or winter and summer, separated by relatively drier periods in the spring and fall. In the winter, large Pacific low pressure storm systems sweep across uh, the region, pulling moisture from the Pacific and bringing soaking rains and snow to higher elevations. The higher and colder North Rim sees the heaviest snowfall, around 350 centimeters of snow annually. It's about 12 feet while the South Rim receives about half that, 150 centimeters, or about six feet of snow. This disparity in winter precipitation is largely a product of orographic uplift, having air being lifted up to higher elevations because of the topography, with higher regions of the park, like the North Rim, pushing the air up to elevations where clouds and snow begin to form and fall. The Inner Canyon, uh, like the Colorado River, rece hardly receives snow, as any snow falling overhead uh, will warm up and often melt before it reaches the bottom. So let's try to understand why does the North Rim receive so much more snow in the winter time than the South Rim does? This is because the air is being pushed up onto the North Rim to a higher elevation. The North Rim is roughly 400 meters higher uh, than the South Rim. So if we take an air mass at about 8 degrees Celsius to the south of the Grand Canyon, let's say it's at 1500 meters in elevation and we push it up to the different heights to the south rim, which is at 2,200 meters, or to the north rim, which is at about 2,600 meters, we're going to cause it to cool down. As we lift air up, it's going to expand and it's going to cool at what's called the dry adiabatic lapse rate. This is about 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer, or one degree Celsius per 100 meters. So if we lift it up and we can say that the dew point, the point where the air temperature needs to reach for clouds to form, and for precipitation to eventually fall is zero degrees Celsius. So we have eight degrees Celsius as our starting temperature and our dew point's at zero. So our air parcel currently is not saturated. Eight is not the same as zero. So we're going to cool at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So one degree Celsius for every 100 meters. So at 1500, we're going to cool up until 2200 meters. Now we're at one degree Celsius. That's still not dew point. So there aren't actually any clouds and any precipitation on the south rim. We lift up the air 100 more meters to 2,300 meters, and now we're at dew point, zero degrees. We cooled off one degree for every 100 meters, and now clouds can begin to form. So the clouds aren't forming over the south rim because the south rim isn't high enough. We keep lifting it, and what happens now is because we have condensation, because we have dew point, our water vapor, our gas, condenses into a liquid. When this happens, the air inside warms up a little bit because of that phase change. As water goes from a solid, or uh, in this case from a gas, down into a liquid, it has to release some energy. Gas has more energy than water. So as it releases some of that energy, it cools off at a slower rate. Instead of one degree Celsius for every 100 meters, now it's gonna cool off at about 0.6 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. This is called the wet adiabatic lapse rate. You can kind of think of it as uh, one degree Celsius per every hundred meters, and then you add a little bit of heat to it. So instead of minus one, you've got something like minus one plus 0.4 degrees Celsius for every hundred meters, resulting in 0.6 degrees Celsius for every hundred meters. So now, because we have clouds forming, little condensation, our air parcel is not cooling as fast as we lift it up to the north rim. 
And so this results, instead of minus 1, it's minus 0. 0.6. So by, by the time we get to the north rim, our air temperature is actually negative 1.8, about negative 2 degrees Celsius. And because we're below dew point, we've had clouds form, our temperature is below freezing, we likely have snow at this elevation now because we've had a dew point reach, we've had condensation, probably have snow falling out of these clouds. So this disparity is caused by this orographic uplift. A lot of these storms are going to bring air from the south and lift it up onto the rim. The same thing happens during the summer monsoon. We have a change in wind direction that causes a change in moisture in the air. A monsoon is just a seasonal reversal in the wind. It's not a thunderstorm, it's a change in winds seasonally. So during the early spring, we have, in early summer, we have uh, a region of high pressure around northern Mexico. This causes air to be moved around it clockwise, and as a result, our, the flow over the southwest is generally from the west. What happens then is during the summer, during the monsoon season, later in July and August, this ridge of high pressure shifts to the north, around the Four Corners, uh, kind of New Mexico area. This resulting change in the pressure changes the winds. Now instead of winds coming from the southwest, we have winds coming from the south. This pulls moisture up from the Gulf of California, even the Gulf of Mexico. Having more moisture in the air, as well as the intense surface heating, is a pretty good catalyst for having thunderstorms form. Mornings in the Grand Canyon during the summertime often begin clear, but as heating of the surface along the rims progresses, localized updrafts can occur. The rims act as what's called a focusing mechanism for updrafts to form. As those updrafts rise into the humid air, you get clouds and eventually thunderstorms. The reason why the rims act as a focusing mechanism is because the air right above the north rim or the south rim is going to heat up from the ground much faster than the air over the canyon. So you have this localized area of warmer air. This acts as an area of low pressure, it's more buoyant than the air around it, and so you have this rising area of air right along the north and south rim. As these updrafts continue, you can result in thunderstorms, having lightning, localized heavy precipitation, and flash flooding. Storms that move off of the rim often dissipate because of the dramatic drop in precipitation and the lack of rising air. And rain that does fall over the canyon floor can evaporate on its way down. This is called virga. This results in relatively lower precipitation values at the canyon floor than on the rims because you have the storms start out along the rim typically and then sometimes the rain can't even reach the canyon floor. Due to the large range of temperature and precipitation over the Grand Canyon, there is an incredible diversity of plant and animal life. There are five distinct biotic communities or ecoregions that are found in the Grand Canyon. These are the Boreal Forest, the Ponderosa Pine Forest, the Pinyon Juniper Woodland, the Desert Scrub, and the Riparian Zone. Precipitation and temperature are the most relevant variables for determining the ecoregions within the Grand Canyon. Multiple ecoregions can exist within one temperature or one precipitation regime. For example, an annual average temperature of 10 degrees Celsius, or roughly 50 degrees Fahrenheit, can have four different habitats that are possible, depending on the amount of annual precipitation. So above 2,400 meters, or roughly 8,000 feet, the boreal forest is only found along the north rim. This community is the coolest and wettest in the park. Life here adapts to an extreme winter climate and short, frenzied growing seasons. Here, dense dark spruce and fir forests are mixed with quaking aspen, which drop their golden leaves as winter approaches. These forests are broken by bright open meadows filled with wildflowers and birds in the summer, whereas during the winter, some species will hibernate or migrate away from the north rim. Some plants, like the evergreen trees, are well adapted for this, with their tough, narrow needles that resist freezing and hold on to moisture. Between 2100 and 2400 meters, or roughly 6800 to 8000 feet, the Ponderosa pine forest thrives on both the north and south rim and acts as a transition zone between the boreal forest above and the pinyon juniper woodlands below. Air temperatures here are increasing compared to the boreal forest and precipitation drops. The tall ponderosa pines with thick fire resistant bark stand tall among thickets of gambles oak here. Like the mixed conifer of the boreal forest, this ecosystem is specialized for fire, brought on by the lightning during monsoon season. 
In the past, humans have suppressed these natural wildfires, resulting in the buildup of dense debris and thick underbrush in the naturally open forests. Faster, hotter fires tore through these forests, consuming even the large trees. Thankfully, we now better understand the role of fire in these forests and the fire managers work to safely restore the forests using prescribed burns and forest thinning. Below the canyon edge, between 1,500 and 2,100 meters, or roughly 5,200 and 6,800 feet, hot, dry breezes rise from the inside the canyon in the pinyon juniper woodland. Thin soils here hold little water, and with less precipitation and warmer temperatures than along the canyon rim, the pinyon and juniper trees here grow short and gnarled. To conserve water, these trees have developed waxy coatings on their needles and leaves. Around five feet of snow still falls in this ecosystem in the winter, while summers are warm. The hottest and driest ecoregion, the desert scrub, is found between 700 and 1500 meters, or roughly 2500 to 5200 feet. Life here adapts to extreme heat and a very dry climate. Limited precipitation, less than 25 centimeters or 10 inches annually, comes in the form of cool, gentle winter rains and violent localized monsoon thunderstorms. Drought-tolerant plants here thrive, like yucca, creosote, and nocotillo. Nocturnal animals like bats, ringtails, and owls avoid the heat of day by coming out only at night. Generally around the same height as the desert scrub region, the riparian habitat is found along the Colorado River at the bottom of the canyon, around 700 to 800 meters or 2,500 feet. This ecosystem can also be found in the higher in the canyon, wherever water can be found in hanging springs or creeks located among canyon walls. This habitat is the smallest in the Grand Canyon, but supports the greatest biodiversity. Cottonwood trees, ferns, willows, frogs, and other unique plants and animals found nowhere else in the Grand Canyon thrive in these small corridors where water is in constant supply. It's a bit more complicated in these elevations, though. These habitat zones cover a wide elevation gradient, a result of the north-south facing slopes of the Grand Canyon. Locations on the south-facing walls receive more direct sunlight throughout the year and encounter higher temperatures and resulting higher evaporation rates than north-facing locations. This allows for cooler habitat zones to exist in the north-facing slopes of the Grand Canyon. So in conclusion with this lecture, we've talked about how the temperature and precipitation across the Grand Canyon changes dramatically because of the change in elevation as well as the change in seasonal uh, wind patterns across the region. We've looked at the orographic influences, how elevation can influence winter precipitation, as well as influence thunderstorms brought on by the North American monsoon. We've also looked at the different ecoregions found within the Grand Canyon and explained why different slopes, north facing or south facing, have plant life existing on them, whereas south facing slopes might not. Thanks for watching.